and welcome to all of you to the second annual Elizabeth T. and Abram P. Pawlowski Memorial Lecture. The Pawlowski Memorial Lecture was endowed by their daughters, Nora Levin Abrams and Joan Wall, like their parents are exemplars of Jewish education and committed leaders of our Philadelphia Jewish community. I also dutifully and endearingly acknowledge Sharon and Jonathan Levin, third generation educators and communal leaders, Jonathan is a member of the Executive Committee of Gratz College's Board of Governors. I know that all generations, and thank goodness there are many, of the extended Pulaski family join me and the Gratz community in welcoming this evening's speaker. Professor Sivan Zakai is the Sarah S. Lee Associate Professor of Jewish Education at the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in Los Angeles. In addition to directing the Children's Learning About Israel Project, we'll hear a little bit about that, and co-directing Project Orly, Research and Leadership in Israel Education. She serves as a senior editor of the Journal of Jewish Education, recent issue all about Israel education. She served as the editor and as a member of the faculty at the Mandel Teacher Educator Institute. Her book, My Second Favorite Country, How American Jewish Children Think About Israel, received the 2020, the 2022 National Jewish Book Award in Education and Jewish Identity. Drawn from that award-winning research, her lecture this evening, How American Jewish Children Think About Israel, represents the research and thinking of one of the most extraordinary scholars in the field of Israel education and Jewish education writ large. Dr. Zakai's presentation betokens our community's broader commitment to serious, sensitive, and open-minded consideration about Israel and about all things in all its complexities, something that Gratz does very, very well. Without further ado, I am so, so thrilled to welcome Dr. Zakai to our Gratz community. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you so much, President Ellis, for that beautiful introduction. Thank you to Naomi. And also, thank you so much to the Pawlowski family for making all of this possible today. Today, I'm going to talk to you about how American Jewish children think about Israel. And I'm going to dive right in by introducing you to one child who um, has the same name as Naomi. I'd like to introduce you to a child named Naomi. Naomi was raised in a bilingual English-Spanish-speaking Reformed Jewish household in Los Angeles. I met Naomi when she was in kindergarten. She was five years old, and that was in the 2012-2013 school year. At this moment in time, Naomi is a high school sophomore, and I've been following her throughout her trajectory as she has grown up. When she was much younger, I started asking her the question, where is Israel? To try and get a sense of how Naomi and how other Jewish children think about Israel and its place in their own Jewish lives. When she was in first grade, this was Naomi's answer. It's far, far away from here. And you can hear in this answer a little bit of folklore, right? It's a, la a land far, far from here a long, long time ago. And as Naomi grew up, she began to give different and you'll see increasingly sophisticated answers to the same question. When I asked her this question in third grade, her answer was, where's Israel? It's in the Middle East, on the other side of the earth from America. Still far, far away from here, but now grounded in an actual geographic location. And that is a developmental leap that she was able to make as she grew. That very same question in fifth grade got a very different answer from the same child. Physically, Naomi explained, it's far away, but it's also near because emotionally it's right in my heart. And it's only in fifth grade that Naomi began to develop what scholars call place attachment, a sense that a place can be both a physical, physical place in the world and also a place that has symbolic resonance. Amazingly, Naomi's answers from the very concrete, it's a faraway place, to the more sophisticated, it's a place in the Middle East, to the more symbolic, physically it's far, but also it's emotionally right in my heart, is the kind of trajectory that I have seen a bunch of Jewish children go through as they grow up. In fact, Naomi's answers are similar to the answers of all of the children that I have been interviewing over the course of many, many years. 
I met Naomi as part of the Children's Learning About Israel Project, a project of the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel Center for Studies in Jewish Education at Brandeis University. And the purpose of this project was to track Jewish children as they developed over time, trying to understand how it is that children understand, think, and feel about Israel. The findings from this research are the heart of this book. And the book asks three primary questions. How do Jewish children in the United States think about Israel? How do they feel about Israel? One is a cognitive question and one is an emotional question. And you can see in Naomi's answers that kids are able to do both cognitive thinking and emotional connecting. And how do children's thoughts and feelings develop over time? When I first started this research, there were a whole bunch of very basic questions that we, the field of Jewish education, had exactly no answers to. In fact, at the time, we didn't even know, do young children learning about Israel from afar even understand that Israel is a real place? Might they think about Israel perhaps like Arendelle, the frozen wasteland in Disney's Frozen, an imaginary country, but not a real one that you could actually visit? And at what age do children understand that Israel is a real place, a real country, and that you could go there? That is very basic information. It turns out the answer to that question is three years old. That is the age at which children are able to understand that Israel is a, a real ge a place with a geographic location. But we didn't even know that. And it seems absurd when you think about it. We would never expect educators to teach about math education to teach children without a basic understanding of how children themselves think about fractions. We would never expect language educators, whether they teach Hebrew or Spanish or any other language, to teach children without a basic understanding of how children learn to conjugate verbs. And yet, we have been asking Jewish educators to teach about Israel without any understanding of how Jewish children learn, think, and feel about Israel. And my goal in this project was to try and develop that knowledge base. This was a longitudinal study, which means that I started with this group of children when they were in kindergarten, which was in the 2012-2013 school year. And I followed them very carefully every year through eighth grade. I still keep in touch with the children, but I'm not formally studying them in the way that I had been. And throughout this longitudinal study, I followed children through moments of great joy in Israel. Think, for example, example of Netta's 2018 Eurovision win. That was incredibly exciting for many Jewish children around the world. And also, I followed children in moments of great tragedy. Think for a moment, and I'll tell you a little bit later about how children responded in the wake of the 2014 war between Israel and Gaza. And also in the mundane moments, just the everyday for years and years, I followed children to try and understand how they think about Israel, how they feel about Israel, and how their thoughts and feelings develop over time. You might be wondering, who are these children that you studied, Sivan? So I want to give you a little bit of information about their characteristics. The children shared some things in common. They are all Jewish children, although not all of their parents identify as Jewish. And they were all part of the 2012-2013 kindergarten cohort. They all started kindergarten in the same year. I found all of the children, I connected with them originally in three Jewish day schools, one reform, one conservative, and one non-denominational community school that was more traditional and leaning. And yet I've been following these children for so many years that you can't say that they are day school students, all of them. They took various winding paths in their educational journeys. Even by first grade, there were children in the study who were enrolled in public school, in suburban and charter schools, in independent, non-Jewish independent schools. And I have been following them as they've grown. They're all children who are receiving some form of Jewish education, in some cases in day schools, in some cases in supplementary schools, some children in camps. And one child has been homeschooled throughout the study, and she receives tutoring in Jewish studies. And all of these children are situated in Los Angeles, which is where I live, which is the most ethnically diverse Jewish community of any city in the world. Despite these commonalities, the children also had a bunch of differences. They come from diverse 
ethnic Jewish backgrounds, from a range of Jewish denominations, some are not affiliated, reform, conservative, modern Orthodox Chabad children all participated in this study. Their parents have wildly divergent political views, both about the United States and about Israel, and many different languages are spoken in the children's homes. The children's parents collectively were born in eight different countries, and if you go back to their grandparents' generation, that number doubles to 16 different countries. For years and years, as I said, I've been following these children, and I've used a bunch of methods to try and capture windows into children's thinking. Some of what I've done with the children is interviews. You saw earlier one question I asked children, where is Israel? But I also have asked a range of other questions. My favorite question that I've always asked is, imagine that there were an alien who came down from outer space, understood English, but didn't otherwise know anything about life on Earth. How might you explain to the alien what it means to be Jewish, what it means to be American, what it means to be Israeli? And these kinds of questions capture children's thinking and also their developing theories about the world in which they're living. I've done storytelling exercises, asking children to tell me a story. Tell me a story about when Israel became Israel, I would ask. And it would elicit children's thinking about history. Or tell me a story about something that's happening in Israel right now and would elicit children's thinking about current events. I've done something called photo and music elicitation where I will show children images or play them sound or audio clips to try and capture their thinking about particular issues. And also, as you'll see in the slides, I've been collecting children's work as they have grown. In each case, I've been tracking children's differing answers to the same questions over the course of nine consecutive years. And as you saw with the example I started with, with Naomi, as children age, as they develop and as they come to have a more sophisticated understanding of the world, of Israel, of the Jewish community, their answers to the same questions change. Today I'm gonna to share with you four lessons that I have learned in the nine year process of tracking these children's development. I'm gonna share a question, uh, a lesson that I learned about how Jewish children learn about Israel in the first place. I call this lesson, I searched it up. I'm gonna tell you a lesson that I learned about how Jewish children situate Israel in their own lives. And I call that lesson, my second favorite country. I'm gonna tell you a lesson about how Jewish children experience the Israeli-Palestinian and Israeli-Arab conflict. And I call that lesson, as if I were there. And I'm gonna teach you a lesson that I learned about what children are requesting from the adults in their lives, the adults who love them, their parents, their teachers, their rabbis and their community. And this is a lesson called, You Never Told Me. And you can see in each of these cases, I'm directly quoting children, because one of the questions that I ask year after year is, I'm gonna write a book about your thoughts and your ideas. What is it that you think is most important for people to know about how you as a Jewish child think about the world and think about Israel? So we'll start with this first lesson. I searched it up a lesson about how Jewish children learn about Israel. And in order to understand the answer to this question, right, how do Jewish children learn about Israel? First, we have to understand how children learn in general. I liken children's learning, a process that happens from the moment of birth and does not end, to the process of patchwork quilting. Children are gathering information in tiny bits and pieces from all sorts of places in their environment, and they are stitching those together into a larger quilt. And that quilt can take pieces from any interaction that a child has at any moment in time and any location. In fact, the vast majority of children's learning about any topic does not happen in a formal educational setting. It happens all over as children encounter the world. So how do children say that they learn about Israel in particular? Well, from all different sources, from human beings, from their parents and their rabbis, from their peers, from their grandparents, from members of their community, from all sorts of physical resources, books and news, 
from the prayers that we use in our synagogue, from all sorts of places. And you can see it larger on the slides than everything else, especially from the internet. In order to understand the absolute power of the internet in children's learning in general, but about Israel in particular, it's really important to understand that children make a conceptual leap in middle childhood, a leap that literacy specialists call the transition from learning to read to reading to learn. When children are very little, there's pre-literacy, and as they enter those early elementary school grades, they're learning to read. They're learning to decode words. They're learning that letters bring together and that words have meaning. And when kids are in this phase, they are really focused on learning about the world by hearing mostly. But there's a transition that happens. In most kids, it happens somewhere in second or in third grade where kids transition to reading to learn. They already know, know how to decode and they start to just take in all sorts of information about the world in print. Well, an amazing phenomenon happens as Jewish children try and learn about Israel that has to do with this specific moment in time. Because as children are learning to read, they primarily rely on the adults in their lives to relay information about Israel. They might hear about Israel on the news, but primarily they learn from their parents, their grandparents, their siblings, their peers, their teachers. However, once kids hit a moment where they are reading to learn, again, this is somewhere around second or third grade, everything changes. And children rely more and more as they grow on the internet as their primary source of information about Israel. And that should give all the adults on this Zoom call today a bit of pause. Children are primarily learning about Israel in places that were not constructed for children's learning. I've heard kids talk about going and Googling information. Why would they even know to Google information about Israel? I'll tell you, I, I listened to one story that a child told me when he was in third grade. He was at a restaurant with his family. And his aunts and uncles were there talking about something that to him was incredibly boring. And so he started zoning out. And he noticed that in the corner of the restaurant, there was a TV screen. And at the bottom of the TV screen was ticker tape running in the news program telling him that there had been, in his own telling, a bomb happening in Israel. I actually, that was enough. He didn't hear the news, and he certainly didn't hear the adult in his life talking about it. He went home. Nobody even knew he did this. His parents probably thought he was asleep. He opened a computer, and he typed into Google, bomb in Israel, and he started watching news. Is that story gives you a little bit of pause. The next story I'm going to tell you about the next lesson that I learned from children should bring a little bit of relief. This is a lesson about how Jewish children situate Israel in their own lives. And any of you who are familiar with the larger discourse on American Jews in Israel have heard the common trope, young Jews don't care about Israel. They feel apathetic. They feel disengaged. And that is not at all what I have learned from Jewish children who def definitely do not feel apathetic or disengaged. In order to understand this lesson, you have to understand first how children come to think about countries in general. And there's a developmental phenomenon and it has been shown since the 1950s and the work of Piaget and his students that suggests that before the age of approximately eight years old, children's understanding of and relationships with countries is pretty idiosyncratic. A child might say, I like a country because my babysitter went there, France, or because I think it sounds so beautiful. Listen to the name of that country, Ireland. Doesn't that sound so pretty? But there's no actual there there before the age of eight. But once kids hit this developmental stage at age eight, something different becomes, begins to happen. And this has been replicated in democratic societies across the globe. When kids who are being raised in democratic societies get age eight, they get it to a developmental stage where they believe without a shadow of a doubt that their own country is the best country in the entire world. So kids in Italy say, Italy is the best country. And kids in the United States say, the United States is the best country. 
Well, in listening to children talk about Israel as they developed, I noticed that it, at this exact same developmental stage, a special phenomenon was happening in the words of Jewish children who began to speak of a favorite and a second favorite country. Just like you would expect, and as has been replicated in studies across contexts and across cultures, Jewish children living in the United States, when they hit eight, believe without a shadow of a doubt that the United States is the best country in the world. It is a place of freedom and democracy, and it is the best. But they also start to talk about their second favorite country, the second best country in the world, Israel, which they understand is not only a country, but also a specifically Jewish place. And as kids age, they develop increasingly sophisticated theories about what it even means to have a country that is a Jewish country, and also increasingly sophisticated understanding of what it means to have a Jewish country where not all of the citizens of that country are Jewish. This kind of place attachment where Jewish children talk about Israel as their second favorite country means that from a very early age, Jewish children in the United States come to think about Israel as holding a special place in their hearts, in their souls, and in the collective life of the Jewish people. The third lesson I want to share with you is a lesson called As If I Was There, a lesson about how Jewish children experience the Israeli-Arab-Palestinian conflict. And I want to highlight for you two different words here in this framing. The first is the word experience. It's a little bit of a strange word. What do you mean experience the conflict? Jewish children in the United States are very, very far. Their bodies are physically removed from the conflict. But actually, in most children's telling, it is still something that they experience, and I'll explain why in a moment. The second phrase I want to call your attention to here is the Israeli-Arab slash Palestinian conflict. It's a bit of a mouthful. Political scientists use this term to indicate the nested nature of the conflict, such that there is an Israeli-Palestinian conflict that exists both within but also separate from a larger Israeli-Arab conflict. But I use this term because in many children's minds, that is not, there's no conceptual distinction. The conflict is the conflict, and there's just one big messy muck until kids hit approximately fifth grade, at which point they can start to conceptually distinguish between an Israeli-Arab conflict, an Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and Israeli-Iranian conflict. In order to help you understand how children think about the conflict, I want to introduce you to two children. The first child is Samantha. Samantha was raised in an English-speaking conservative Jewish household in Los Angeles. And from the very first conversation I ever had with Samantha, she was five years old, and she told me, I know about the conflict. I know a ton about the conflict. And I asked, how is that possible? How do you know? What do you know? And here's what she told me. When I was born, I straight away knew about the war in Israel. My mom talked about it when I was in my mom's tummy. And so I learned. In many Jewish children's telling, the conflict is something that they believe that they have always known about, even in utero. They can't actually recall a time early enough in their own childhood when they were not deeply aware that Israel is embedded in a conflict or engaged in a conflict. And as they grow, it becomes with increasing detail and sophistication that they understand what happens in that conflict. I want to introduce you to another child named Carly. Carly was raised in a bilingual English, Farsi-speaking, traditional Jewish household in Los Angeles. And in 2014, Carly was in second grade. She was a rising second grader in the year between first and second grade when a war broke out in Israel. And Carly, like many of the children in the study, learned about this war in excruciatingly painful detail. And they knew about all sorts of violent current events that were happening in the world around them, in large part because of their use of the internet. One of the catalysts for that larger conflict was the kidnapping of three Israeli teenagers. And Carly knew in great detail about 
this event. One of the things that she explained to me was that after the, the three boys who were kidnapped, the three Israeli teenagers were kidnapped, in her own words, a lot of Jewish families named their new babies after the three boys. And Carly explained to me that she knew that in many Jewish traditions, you only name a baby after a relative who has died or a loved one who has died. And so Carly was telling me that she understood that these three Israeli teenagers had been kidnapped and murdered. Those of you who remember this terrible moment in Israeli history will also remember that there was a retaliatory kidnapping and murder of a Palestinian teenager that same time. Carly had no idea that that had happened, but she was deeply aware of all sorts of tragic details about this kidnapping and murder of three Israeli teenagers. And yet, Carly, when she, all was said and done, also did something that typically happens only with children who have been traumatized by war. She started to rewrite the narrative. She knew what had happened. She told me what had happened. And yet she also told a different version of the story in which, in her telling, and in the end, the three boys got out and they escaped. And this is a move that is typical of children who experience childhood trauma in wartime situations. They are able to simultaneously recount actual traumatic events that happened. And they also, as a psychological coping mechanism, end up rewriting those stories as a way of making themselves feel better about what they know is actually quite a terrible thing. And Carly and many of the other children in this study did that thing, where they retold stories to make themselves feel better, even though they knew tragic and horrible details. I come to call this phenomenon remote trauma. And the reason that I use the word remote when talking about this trauma, and you can see Carly's depiction of that moment in time in this piece of artwork. I call this remote trauma because it's remote in two senses of the word. Unlike any child who was actually living in Israel, Carly was absolutely safe at every moment in this war. No part of her was in danger in any moment. It was remote from her life. And yet, she still felt traumatized by it. But it was also, I also call it remote trauma for a second reason, because in most kids' experiences, they were experiencing the war. And now I'm using their words, mostly through remote controls and computer mouses. And this is what it sounded like when they reflected. It's like I watched it myself, Carly explained. Samantha, who I introduced you to earlier, who thought that she knew about the conflict even in utero, said, it's as if I were there. Jewish children in the United States whose own bodies are absolutely secure and safe, at least from the Israeli-Palestinian and Israeli-Arab and Israeli-Iranian conflicts, nonetheless talk as if they had experienced personal trauma. And they can distinguish it in their words. They don't say, I was there. They don't say, I watched it. It's like I watched it. It's as if I were there. And that is a very heavy thing that Jewish children are sitting with. The fourth lesson that I want to share with you today is a lesson called You Never Told Me, a lesson about what I hear Jewish children repeatedly say that they want from the adults in their lives, from their teachers, from their rabbis, from their parents, and from their grandparents. In order to understand this lesson, I want to make sure first that everyone is familiar with the movement, If Not Now. If Not Now is a movement of politically progressive, left-wing, young Jewish adults. And If Not Now has a bunch of different campaigns, one of which is a campaign called You Never Told Me. It's a campaign that is directed with quite a bit of anger and frustration at what they think of as the American Jewish establishment and especially at educational institutions, Jewish camps, Jewish schools, Jewish youth movements. The You Never Told Me campaign is a quest by If Not Now to get American Jewish educational institutions to teach about occupation. And they are very upset that they did not learn about this concept in their Jewish institutions. Well, as I've been listening to the words of Jewish children, 
children who have never heard of If Not Now and who have never, ever heard of the You Never Told Me campaign. Children who are not politically progressive, their own parents are from across the political spectrum, almost word for word mirror the language of the If Not Now movement. And I have heard children use this exact same phrase, you never told me, except when children use this language, they're not talking about Israeli treatment of Palestinians. When children use this language, they're talking about a broad range of social and political issues in Israel that matter deeply to the worldwide Jewish community that they believe their parents and teachers have not sufficiently taught them about. I wanna give you an example of the most difficult moment that I had in this entire process, listening to children's stories. In order to do that, I wanna introduce you to Gia. Gia was raised in a progressive Jewish household, non-denominational in Los Angeles. And Gia took her first visit to Israel with her family when she was eight years old. She was so excited to go. And of all the things she knew she was gonna to get to do, the thing she most wanted to do was to visit the Kotel. She had gone with her classroom in kindergarten to an imaginary Kotel that they had built in the school. You can see a replica of it here. And she believed in her heart of hearts that the Kotel was a magical place. In fact, she talked about it kind of like a fairy godmother or a tooth fairy. All you have to do is go to this place, this magical place, she would say, and you would put your wish or your prayer in the wall and suddenly, magically, it would be granted. It was the best thing that existed in the Jewish world in Gia's eight-year-old mind. And then Gia actually went to Israel and she got to go to the Kotel. The first thing that happened, Gia recounted right upon returning from her trip, the first thing that happened was she had a momentary shock because in the imaginary Kotel in Gia's classroom, there was no machitza, there was no divider between the men and women section. And she did not know until that very moment that that was even a thing. In her own home synagogue, there is no machitza. And she did not know that there would be a separate space for men and for women. And the first thing that she did in her mind was she said, hey, that's not fair. I see that the women's section is smaller. I'm a little annoyed at that. And then Gia had an absolute panic attack. And that is because Gia has two dads and brothers. And Gia realized, standing there at the Kotel, that if she wanted to touch those magical stones, she would have to go by her eight-year-old self with no one in her family who could come with her to the women's section. And she absolutely unraveled in that moment. I don't think the moment actually lasted that long. But it is a moment that Gia has retold me about every single year of her childhood. And every single year, she has told me that in this moment, before her tour guide helped her and her parents to Robinson's Arch, which is a part of the wall where her family could be together. In that moment, Gia realized, you never told me. You had this information. You could have prepared me for what I was going to see. And yet you didn't. When she told me the story in sixth grade, which after having told me the same story again and again, she had put it like this. I love my parents. I love my teachers. I think they're great in everything except for this. They really messed up here. And this language you never told me that Gia said upon seeing the Kotel for the first time was echoed in the words of many, many Jewish children as they encountered for the first time, sometimes on the internet, sometimes in visits to Israel, and sometimes in larger Jewish communal discourse, questions that had to do with sticky political issues. And children were saying, politics is usually kept out of my classroom, but I need some help understanding it. So I've given you the four biggest lessons that I have learned from the children. A lesson about how Jewish children learn about Israel and that moment in time between second and third grade where children shift from learning primarily from adults to an increasing presence of the internet in their own learning. 
my second favorite country, a lesson about how Jewish children situate Israel in their lives in ways that both mirror the developmental literature and also hold up, raise up the fact that Israel is an important place in their own Jewish lives. A, question, a lesson about how Jewish children feel that they themselves have experienced a conflict, even though that conflict is far away. And a lesson in which I have heard Jewish children repeatedly say, you never told me. You never told me that Israel was not just a beautiful place of wishes and dreams, but also a messy place with political realities that I want deeply to understand. If we zoom out from all of this, we think not about any one lesson, but about the larger experience of learning from children. The biggest takeaway that I have from this study is that American Jewish children, like many American Jewish adults, care deeply about questions that matter in the Jewish community, and that includes questions about Israel. One reader of the book once likened it to children pressing their face against the glass of Jewish life. They want in. They want into communal conversations. They want to be included. And yet, they also need more guidance to understand a place that is actually quite complicated, not only because it is the intersection of past and present and the intersection of a spiritual sense and a, a real earthly sense of reality, but also because it is a place that is contested in contemporary Jewish life. It is a place that many Jews have deep, deep feelings of attachment to and also profoundly deep questions about its present and future. Jewish children want in on that conversation. They don't want to have to get to Israel or get to Google and turn to their parents and say, hey, you never told me that. They're asking to be included in this larger conversation. And to me, that is a really, really beautiful and a really, really hopeful thing. One more word before we go to questions. And that is this. In Jewish education in general, the field has spent a lot of time focusing on what knowledge adults have that should be transmitted to the next generation. And that has been a core part of Jewish educational practice first centuries. And part of what I'm inviting you all to do in listening to the words and the thoughts of children today is to flip the switch a little and flip the script. Children actually have what to teach us. They have their own thoughts and ideas, beliefs and opinions that are beautiful and confusing and messy and gorgeous in all sorts of ways. And we have something to learn from them and their ways of seeing the world, which in some ways mirror and in some ways differ from the ways that adults do. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I'm going to hand it back to President Ellis to facilitate questions. Thank you so, so very much, uh, President Zakai. Um, so we have a number of questions. I invite others to uh, put into the question and answer. So, um, I'll start with the uh, first question is, are there parallels in other ethnic or faith communities? Um, do um, people from Vietnam, Puerto Rico, do they also, uh, Cuba, do they also grapple with the tensions of my first and my second favorite country? Yeah, that is a really interesting question. And it is one that I thought about a lot when I started this study. And I was trying to find out how do other communities um, how do the children in other communities think about their own home country? And there's some parallels, but there are also some profound differences. One of the profound differences I learned from the work of Ted Sassone, if you haven't read his book, The New American Zionism, it's definitely a must read for all who care about American Jews in Israel. And one of the things that he points out is how actually American Jewish relationships to Israel isn't exactly equivalent to, say, a second generation Venezuelan in America because most American Jews' direct ancestors didn't actually come from Israel. I told you about how the children in this study, their parents came from eight different countries, their grandparents came from 16, one of those is Israel. 
But in many Jewish children's own experiences, their parents were born in Iran or in the Soviet mm. Union or in New York. And they don't have direct memories of ancestors in the homeland. And so what is similar to a different context is the role of the internet, right? That is definitely true. But actually, in some ways, it's even more so in other communities because you might be able to FaceTime a relative, a grandparent even, in your own home country. That's not actually true for most American Jewish children. They don't have grandparents. There, of course, is a huge Israeli expatriate community in the United States. Um, but other than that community, most mm -hmm. American Jews do not have direct ancestors who came, at least in recent generations, from Israel. And so Israel functions as a symbolic homeland more than the actual homeland. And that is a really complicated idea for yeah. adults to think about. And children are trying to wrap the, their own minds around that as well. Got it. Wow. Uh, you, uh, you alluded to uh, another question that was submitted actually before uh, we began, uh, which is the role of social media. Uh, you had also indicated in your remarks, uh, social media, not just access, but graphic access, uh, videos, images. Um, how does that help shape? And I know that your study launched your studies on a certain age bracket. But even moving forward, do you have any sense of how that new technology has impacted this fealty and this uh, tension? Sure. And it's just been exacerbated recently with ChatGPT, which just um, kind of expands the existence. Yeah, I'm afraid of, right? of logging on to it. I don't want to be. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can ask ChatGPT any question you would like. You won't always get an accurate answer. So we cannot we cannot get rid of technology and the role of technology in young people's lives. It is ubiquitous and it will continue to be ubiquitous. What Jewish educators, what education in general can do is help children understand that the internet actually functions as a public square. It is not akin to an encyclopedia that has certain factual knowledge, although you can certainly find factual information on the internet. Mm -hmm. It is actually much more akin to what used to be the town square, the meeting place of ideas. And in a meeting place of ideas, we ought to be skeptical and we ought to ask ourselves, what is this person trying to convince me of? And that sometimes becomes hard to see in the internet because you don't actually see the author of every post. You do in some social media sites, but you don't typically on Google. But that kind of basic literacy education that has to do with technological literacy is increasingly essential to the work of Jewish education because it is increasingly central to how children understand and get information about the world. Oh. It's hard to pick a segment of Israel history to do this study that represents the history of Israel. 75 years and each segment of it has its own idiosyncrasies. Do you think that your study would have yielded different results in a different epoch in Israel's history? Well, I think that every generation certainly sees Israel in a different way. And every, every generation experiences the world and the process of learning. And in fact, schools in many ways have changed over time. So yes. I do think that there is something that is specific to this moment in time and this generation of young learners embedded in this. And also, this is the amazing, crazy thing about children's development. And this is not just true about this topic. Children are, I'm about to say two contradictory things that are actually both true. One is that every child is unique and beautiful in their own way. Every child is idiosyncratic. And by that measure, every generation Beautiful, idiosyncratic in their own way, right? And it is also true that children develop along common developmental patterns. And the parts of this research that have uncovered developmental patterns probably won't change so much over time. Children are not magically going to learn to read at a different age. I mean, a little bit younger, a little bit older, yeah. for sure. Um, there's certain kinds of understanding that are deeply embedded in the practice of Jewish education. For example, if you will look at most of the PJ library books that are created about Israel for young children, they all have a very common trope. 
We're going to go to Jerusalem. We're going to go to Tel Aviv. We're going to go to the desert. We're going to go to the mountain. But actually, children do not understand geography. They do not understand the nested nature of geography, such that a city exists within a state. By the way, a state means two different things when we're talking about the United States and Israel. And here, a state is also embedded in a country, and a country is embedded in a geographic area. All of these things that have to do with geography, no child born at any age or at any moment will be able to conceptually wrap their heads around because it is not developmentally within the grasp of young children. And yet many of our educational resources ask children to do exactly the things that they are not developmentally ready to do. Wow. Um, one uh, comment from a Pulaski grandchild, and again, Nona and Joan, thank you so much, the entire family for decades of commitment and partnership with Gratz College. Uh, they indicate that indeed their grandparents would have deeply appreciated uh, your study and commentary. Um, I will add to that is how have you know in being in interviewing children and going into schools of really um, co a complex variety of schools, can you say something about the pedagogy? And you edited uh, the latest issue, I think it's the latest issue of, uh, of Jewish education um, and how we teach, how do we deploy Israel education? Are, are there different ways, that, different um, modalities that you observed uh, in the various uh, sites that you visited? For sure. And anyone who's really interested in deeply understanding the question you just asked ought to take a look at the most recent issue of the Journal of Jewish Education, which is specifically devoted to the competing ideologies and philosophies mm -hmm. of Israel education, which have profoundly different uh, practices embedded in them. I will say that one of the most interesting and surprising, I did not know this when I set out, things that I have learned from listening to Jewish children who really learn in quite different contexts from one another. They have different synagogue communities, different kinds of schools, camps, et cetera. Um, is that actually there's a common thing that children across these settings are asking for pedagogically? And that is something that I call an engagement with prism questions. Prism is a metaphor for, right, if you hold a prism up, it will refract light into a spectrum of colors. And there are certain kinds of questions. Questions like, what makes a home Jewish? Or what ought the future of the state of Israel look like? Questions that we know adult Jews do not agree on fundamentally. We do not actually have a common answer to those questions. That's in fact what makes them really interesting questions. What ought the future of the state of Israel look like? That's an interesting question. What makes a home a Jewish home? Different Jews in different communities in different moments in different times and space have answered that question differently. Those are questions that are inherently interesting and that reveal a spectrum of Jewish experiences. And those are the kinds of questions that kids are grappling with at every moment as they grow. I want to contrast that with the question, why is there a Jewish star or a Magen David on the Israeli flag? That is not the same kind of question. That is a question that has an answer. It's rooted in a historical moment. And then once you learn it, it's not that interesting anymore. Most of what happens actually in many Jewish classrooms and many Jewish camps is that latter kind of question. It's asking kids to learn the stuff that already has answers that we kind of all agree on. But kids are asking to engage in a different kind of question. Hmm. One more question, our questions, um, returns us to uh, the notion of messiness and our children's uh, desire to be part of telling those messy realities, those messy uh, complex stories about and from Israel. Uh, how do we know how we are, we and our children are equipped appropriately here? And, and how does one gauge and measure that over time? You used very discrete ages. You talked about age three as a, as a very, very important benchmark. How do, as we move forward, how do we filter and how do we properly equip ourselves and our children with educate, with Israel education? Yeah, it's a great question that I cannot entirely answer in this, uh, in this format, but I will say 
I will say two things about it. One is there are developmental stages about children's understanding of different ideas. So for example, at what age do children without a doubt understand that Israel is involved in an ongoing violent conflict? The answer to that question is age five. That is the age at which Jewish children are acutely aware of a conflict and have deep questions about it. At what age do children start asking questions about Palestinians and Palestinian narratives of that same situation? Approximately third grade, give or take, is when I hear children asking about that. At what age do children um, start to understand that different historical narratives can be told and framed in different ways to tell different kinds of Jewish stories with different kinds of religious and political resonances that actually have meaning in our lives, fifth grade. These are different kinds of complexities that are all embedded in the subject of Israel, right? Some are about politics. When do kids have a sense of po politics? Um, approximately fourth grade. If you, in fact, if you ask kids, um, amazing. if you ask kids to talk about Netanyahu and they're younger than about fourth grade, kids will sound much more like each other than like their parents. But once they hit fourth grade and they have an emerging sense of political consciousness, they'll sound much more like their parents than like each other. So there are developmental stages that are built into children's understanding, and um, they don't always line up with common curricular choices made in schools. But there's a different, a different question. You can answer it by saying, when kids hit that phase of development. But there's another thing, which kind of comes from a much larger educational approach about taking our cues from children. If children are asking a question, they're ready to think about the answer. What if you don't have an answer? Either because it's a question that hasn't been answered yet, or because it's a question that we actually probably disagree about the answer. Actually, when children ask questions, they're not always looking for an answer from adults. They're often looking for someone to say, yeah, that's a great question. How should we think about that? And that is work that is done in partnership between adults and children. And it's done in partnership between adults and children at absolutely every stage of development, at age three, at age 13, at age 18, at age seven. Hmm. Okay, one more question for me. Uh, <clears throat> I have to think how to, how to appropriately uh, frame it is, so and you had mentioned about when it, uh, political consciousness and at one point in the book it's a fabulous book I, I absolutely wonderful and why you and why you and you put out a, just a fabulous book and the charts and everything so so clear uh one thing that i was very taken by was um i think the question i'm paraphrasing was how did the jews the israelis i forget exactly who they were get israel and how that answer changes from God, I think Herzl, Abraham, the patriarch is in there. I think uh, British, I think the United Nations. And what's interesting about those inventory of answers is that they run from historical to biblical to theological. And it was a reminder about Israel education discrete from what everything else, no matter the type of school, is tied directly into another area that you've written about so much, which is Jewish identity. And it's not discrete one from the other. How is, is that, is it appropriate? And how does one, when you talk about Israel education as something quite modern, something very much either 1897, 1948, however you piece it, to, wherever you start it. But the way that our, our children absorb it, it's actually a much bigger part of the, I would say lowercase j, Jewish curriculum. What do we do about that? Without, yeah. Well, um, I don't know that we have to do something specific. Sure. But I think it is important to, to acknowledge that that is true. And in fact, part of what was so amazing, and if you think back to that patchwork quilt that I showed you about how kids kind of think that they themselves construct a, an understanding of Israel, it comes from everywhere. So um, a lot of children, even, right, how would a kindergartner even know that Israel's involved in a war? Well, a lot of kids say, well, we say prayers for peace. We say prayer for the state of Israel. We wouldn't say a prayer if there weren't a problem. 
kids are inferring things. This happens in Hebrew education. In fact, if you, if you um, take a look at how different kinds of educational institutions approach Hebrew, whether that's biblical Hebrew or modern Hebrew or anywhere in between, in fact, kids are inferring all sorts of things about Israel from what they're learning in Hebrew. Kids are inferring all sorts of things about Israel from how Jews talk about Jewish communities, how Jews talk about politics, how Jews talk about history. All of these things, again, are being pieced together into a patchwork quilt that doesn't have a specific trajectory and it doesn't even have a curriculum because it doesn't only happen in a classroom. But if a child travels from the home where they overhear a conversation between a mother and a grandfather, and then they travel to the synagogue where they hear the rabbi speaking from the pulpit, and then they travel to a library where they happen to see a book. And that, that is actually how, how learning happens. And that actually is also how a sense of Jewishness gets built mm. over time. Right. We're so fortunate to have you. I want to also single out, I see that among the uh, those who attended is Beth Raisin, uh, who helps lead the Jewish Federation of Greater Philadelphia, together with Lana Ravel at Jewish Learning Venture, um, have locally, we're on Zoom, but locally in our Philadelphia area, had a task force and a working group of Israel educators. And I know they've gained, and so many of them are attending this evening's lecture in the general community as well. Um, we have gotten to learn from the very best in the field. Uh, Sivan, Dr. Zakai, I can't thank you enough for enriching our lives. Uh, it's in Yane Dioma. It is uh, a topic that is very important for now as we come out of Yom Ha'atzma'ut in this season. Uh, our, our teaching and our engagement with Israel and with our children is deeper and more sensitive and more thoughtful because of all of your work. Thank you so, so much. Thank you to everybody in the Pulaski family. Uh, for endowing and to make sure that we get the very best out of Grads College. Thank you so, so much. Thank you for having me here today. And thank you all for coming. And thank you again to the Polanski family.